Hello, I'm Doug Flynn, and welcome to Kentucky Life, here today on the campus of Berea College. Berea is the only one of America's top colleges that gives its students a no-tuition promise, which makes it possible for them to graduate debt-free. When George Washington purchased land in Kentucky, it may have been debt-free, but it wasn't trouble-free. In fact, this little-known episode in Washington's life has all the elements of an 18th century soap opera. He was known as the father of his country, a respected general, and the nation's first president. But did you also know George Washington had another title, that of a Kentucky landowner? He had been over to the Ohio River, to the, he was on the Great Kanawha River there in present-day West Virginia. Uh, and so he had land investments there and had been out into that area and said, well, this is good. This might be really a profitable venture. So kind of on faith, he buys the, the approximately 5,000 acres that he eventually owns here in, here in Kentucky. That land was located in the southern part of the state, now known as Grayson County. And George Washington was just one of the many people who jumped at the westward expansion taking place across the Commonwealth. Leading the call was John Filson, a one-time school teacher turned surveyor and land speculator. John Filson was an interesting character. He comes to Kentucky in 1783, and very quickly, I mean, within a year, he's produced his book and, and map on Kentucky. And these really were promotional tracts. They were, they were publications that were touting Kentucky as kind of the land of opportunity, the Eden of the West. He not only was a good promoter of Kentucky, but he also invested in land. And so he thought, well, you know, if people come, my land investment's gonna become more valuable. That desire to own land launched a virtual land rush in Kentucky. John Filson is part of not only that land rush, but he actually puts it into writing and publishes it. And his book and map from 1784 quickly becomes an international bestseller with a French edition, a German edition, a London edition. Filson even sent the hero of the American Revolution a copy of the book. Well, who better to send it to than somebody like George Washington, who is, of course, the hero of the Revolution, uh, not yet, but not far distant, going to be the first president of the United States of America, uh, who himself was a heavy investor in land. So he knew that Washington had this interest, as so many uh, of the day did. And so if he can get Washington's endorsement for the book, you know, this is only going to help sell copies and, and help bring people to Kentucky. Ever the enterprising soul, not only did Filson profit from his book sales, but from the land rush that followed as well. He saw this as an opportunity, even though he, he says in his own preface that I am not looking to gain monetarily from this. I'm so excited, I'm so enthusiastic about Kentucky uh, that I just really want other people to know about it. But of course, in the back of his mind, there is that, that motive of, I'll make more money if people come and buy my land at a, at a nice profit. That's why Kentucky's early land history is what it is, one of confusion, opportunity, kind of tragedy and, and bankruptcy and things like that is because there's this true land rush of many people coming into Kentucky, buying up the land or thinking they bought up the land uh, because of faulty title and things like that. The scramble was not without disputes, however, with some unscrupulous landholders selling the same parcels of land multiple times over. That possibly included a man named Light Horse Harry Lee, if his name sounds familiar, it should. He was none other than the father of future Civil War leader, Robert E. Lee. In true Kentucky spirit, Harry Lee sold those 5,000 acres in Kentucky to Washington in exchange for one of his prized Arabian stallions, Magnolio, in 1788. There was only one problem. Lee had already sold the same land to someone else, and eventually the land Washington believed was valued at $2 an acre ended up worth less than half that amount. Whether he did it legitimately, sold the land, it's, it's, it's stated in, in some places that he'd actually sold the land to a couple of other people also. 
but never having seen the land, Washington took it on good faith, belief, erroneous reports like Filson that Rough Creek in present-day Grayson County, uh, now Rough River, contained deposits of iron ore. Well, iron ore was a very good, mineable commodity. And, uh, and so, well, this is good. This might be really a profitable venture. The iron ore wasn't actually there. Not in any significant way that mining it would be worth doing. There's questions about Harry Lee's title to property that he bought and sold during his time. Uh, not only a question about whether he actually had a fair, a clear deed to it, but uh, some of the property lines were in question as well. Washington died without ever getting a chance to see his land. And later, descendants eventually sold the land at a loss for less than a dollar an acre. Farmer Leon Joyner currently owns a portion of Washington's original parcel of land and has made a study of its history and preservation. Originally, the land was uh, considerably different as far as flooding is concerned. Uh, the hills were forested in Trent timber. The bottom land is very fertile. It was high risk land to uh, crop down in the bottoms till we got some uh, flood control projects installed and that has much improved. I'm a firm believer in being good stewards of the land that I own. I think it's everybody's responsibility to leave whatever God has entrusted us with as good or better than we found it. It's our obligation to be good stewards of whatever our possessions are. That's foremost in my desire to improve the land, and I get a good bit of satisfaction out of it myself. Despite the incidents of dubious dealings and swindling schemes, the land rush spurred on by visionaries like John Filson had a significant lasting impact on the settlement and eventual statehood of the Commonwealth. Land was the great motivator and someone like a Filson really becomes one of the, the main driving forces for opening up Kentucky to the floodgates of immigration and that dramatic rise in population that Kentucky experienced through the 1790s and into the early 1800s uh, as people literally were pouring into the state. And in their minds, a bit of the credit goes to Filson of thinking that this was a land of great opportunity and as Kentucky has been called, the Eden of the West. 